So my focus is, I think, perhaps more positive than looking at the possible exit. What do we do if we stay with you? Or what do you, what do, you do even if we leave? There was, a, there was an opinion poll was, which forms the backdrop to the referendum in the UK, uh, which was asking, uh, what's the top disadvantage uh, of being a member of the EU? Too many laws and regulations came back, the answer, 65%. Not just too many, though, it's also a question of who they're made by. There's a strong feeling in the UK, it's them in Brussels. We have no influence. And an important point, however onerous, those laws are never repealed. And that is a serious point, that bad laws tend to stay on the statute books. I'm going to look very briefly, in the, in the few minutes allocated to me, at the three main institutions, the Commission, the Parliament and the Court, and suggest a few points. On the Commission, first of all, we must give the Juncker Commission the, the credit where credit is due. They are adopting that the Vice Presidents is set up under the Juncker Commission focus on horizontal issues uh, such as regulatory scrutiny, better regulation, jobs, competitiveness. Not just, it's not just a list of the areas of activity of the, uh, of the EU, but it's trying to look across the board. How can we improve the quality of laws? And there are signs of some results. Uh, President, uh, the President of the Commission, Juncker, uh, was questioned at the European Parliament in April, and he said that uh, to date, uh, that's in, up to April, there were 23 new proposals for laws in the EU uh, this year, compared with there were 136 uh, laws made in the EU in uh, 2015, I'm told. But what a few practical points uh, as to the, the ways in which the Commission could improve. I think greater accountability of commissioners and civil servants. The commissioners should be routinely defend and answerable directly to the parliament. Commissioners should be answerable for the excesses of their civil servants. A small example of an excess. The commission unwisely intervened in a case I was doing in the English courts to oppose an injunction permitting my client to sell his product throughout the EU. The commission lost went back to Brussels and advised the relevant industry, well, that's the UK courts. It's got no effect in, uh, in Europe. So we went back to the court and we applied for uh, a declaration that the European commissioner in question uh, and uh, his officials were in contempt of the court or alternatively were in breach of their duty of loyal cooperation. The judge, on poor legal grounds, rejected the contempt of court. He wasn't prepared to bite that bullet. It sounds in criminal sanctions. But he said, in principle, Mr. Mercer's right. On the basis of the minutes of this meeting, the Commission is failing in, in, in its duty of loyal cooperation with the English court. Formulation of legislation, my next point. International standards exist in many, many areas. The perfect is the enemy of the good. It's not always necessary for the EU to reinvent the wheel, as a case I did, the Ship Source Pollution Directive, the EU can recast the obligations under the International Convention, MARPOL. He complains about the fact that the standards on uh, vacuum cleaners test the vacuum cleaner noise levels when the bag is empty, rather than being half full or full, where evidently his machines must be very competitive. But he says that the reason for that is the strong lobby from the massive uh, German uh, vacuum cleaner manufacturers. Cars, as we know from Volkswagen's travel, uh, troubles, are tested in the lab, not on the road. So let's, big company lobbying is a real problem, let's try and tackle it. My last, uh, and this is really for the Commission, the last point on the Commission, external relations is the competence, mixed competence with the member state, is it exclusive competence for the Commission? The ongoing litigation, I think, probably, I don't know, I mean, Professor Dashwood would know more than I, I think the last count, six or eight cases before the court on that very issue. But really, when the Commission has a real responsibility to uh, cooperate loyally with the member states, it's not a one way. Sweden, in the PFOS case, was told it had to cooperate uh, with, the, with the community uh, and couldn't uh, enter into the Stockholm Convention, uh, or couldn't enter in one product in the Stockholm Convention on its own. But the Commission itself also has a duty of loyal cooperation. All too often, that litigation seems to me uh, to be really about using that well-known legal phrase, who is top dog? And it's not worthy of the, of the, uh, uh, of the work we're engaged in in the European Union. My second institution, the Parliament. We don't see the Juncker signs of movement in the European Parliament. 
The European Parliamentary Committees are a list of what the community does, what the Euro Union does. External trade, uh, legal, uh, and uh, fisheries, agriculture, and so on and so forth. What they, they, they need to engage with what the citizens of Europe are saying. There are too many laws. The new agreement, which the institutional agreement, uh, which Eric mentioned, is a step in that direction with a regulatory scrutiny board. We need sunset clauses on laws so that they end after a certain time. And the Parliament needs a deregulation committee for removing existing laws and improving existing laws. And citizens should be encouraged to come forward and to make the points when they feel that a law is too restrictive. They need to be really policing the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality. Essentially, they need to be doing their job. And at a national level, MEPs, they are starkly absent from our debate in, in the, uh, in the uh, UK at the moment. The only MEPs you see are Nigel Farage, who's only there because he provides lots of expenses and he wants out, and Daniel Hannan, whose job since the Oxford Union days has been to make sure that uh, he tries to bring the uh, UK out of the EU. Where are the MEPs who can tell a positive story about the, uh, uh, about the UK's role in the, EU, in the EU and the UK's influence? Because that is a big issue for people. They feel we have no influence. It's rubbish, but that's what they feel. And I contrast the UK MEPs with a Danish Eurosceptic MEP I met when I was uh, chair of the liaison committee between all bars in Europe and the uh, Court of Justice. And I met Morten Messerschmidt, uh, a Danish Eurosceptic, about the CJEU, about the Court of Justice. And he said, look, let's start the meeting as we need to go on. My own preference would be that there should be no Court of Justice of the European Union. But if there is a Court of Justice, it must work well. That's a sort of admirable pragmatism, which I like and, as a Brit, can relate to. Coming on to the Court of Justice itself, where do we go there? Well, the General Court, first of all, what a name, the General Court. You've got to give that a name which means something. It's the Administrative Court of the EU. The label should inform the citizen what its job is. It should remind the civil servant that there is oversight when he decides that the injunction of a national court has no uh, value in, the, in Europe. Standing for companies to overturn decisions of the European Union, and particularly regulations, even regulations, very specified, focused regulations, the, the rules of standing, the rules of access to the court, far too narrow. Direct and individual concern, essentially, is your situation unique. And the Lisbon attempts to broaden standing have essentially, to my, to my mind, failed through an extra zealous, restrictive interpretation by the court. Depth of review, how, how closely does the court scrutinize the complex decisions of the commission? Do they just say, yes, yes, you technocrats, you get on with it, as one can have, have sometimes have the impression? Netherlands against the commission was a case in 2007. It, the court there said, is the evidence relied on by the commission accurate and reliable? Does it contain all the information to assess the situation? Is it capable of substantiating the conclusions? How often do the decisions of the General Court reach that standard? In my view, not sufficiently often. Delay in the General Court has been very serious. Four to six years to get a decision on a competition issue. Most of my business clients say, well, you know, life will have moved on. I probably won't still be in this job. We'll have to find another way. And so people don't go to court when they should, when they have a right to go to court, but it's going to take too long. And so the final point on the court, resources. Well, one would say maybe one needs more judges. One certainly needs the best judges in this administrative court for the EU. Member states need to think more of their duty of loyal cooperation when they nominate individuals to be judges at the general court. Because they need, really, it's the interest of citizens, it's the interests of uh, member states, because they sometimes challenge decisions of the Commission before that very court. It's in the in interest even of the European civil servants, because if you're a, in DG competition and you are applying a policy over the course of five years, and then in the fifth year you suddenly decide, ah, oh, whoops, it was unlawful all the way along, we've just discovered. And in those decisions, we've been taking, the, the, taking this policy, it was in fact wrong. And that's so it's bad for them. And it's bad for those voices within the Commission which say we should stay within the law. Because there's also that view, well, will we really be brought to account uh, if we, uh, if we uh, continue along the way we've been doing? So in conclusion, brief conclusion, I mean, some of the things I've been suggesting are complex, others are not. Above all, I think it, leads, it needs a change in focus about quality, not quantity. 
and you judge quality by reference to citizens, small businesses, SMEs as we call them. A strong emphasis on reviewing, improving existing legislation. And you need the change in attitude, a bit like the super tanker moving a few degrees off co on course. Less is more, subsidiarity, proportionality are real hurdles. Ditch the pro-integrationist default, because that just means you're always leaning in one direction. You've got to balance integration, more integration. Is more integration in this field? Is that the correct way forward? And dare I say it, greater humility, less amour propre. Sometimes when you look at the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, you see their two golden towers. And I at least think of the article in the FT about uh, 10 years ago, when they were looking at, maybe, maybe it was about 2007 possibly, uh, they were looking at the financial crisis, and they were looking at the correlation between the higher the towers rise and the more shaky the civilization is becoming, looking at San Gimignano and Babel and so on and so forth. But Brexit, having said all that, Brexit is not only an opportunity for the Brits to soul search, for the Brits to look at what their identity is within Europe. It would also be a wasted opportunity if there's not a real effort to adjust the direction of the EU in co collaboration with our pragmatic friends, such as Sweden, Finland, North Netherlands, uh, Germany, Poland, and others. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.